All right, uh, let's get started. So um, my name is Jordan Crawford. I have been doing B2B growth stuff uh, for five, 10 years now, and uh, I get 10 to 20, 30% reply rates on my cold email. Um, so this talk is only gonna be 20 minutes. I'm gonna try to make it as fast as possible. Uh, Guy Kawasaki says that if you, uh, if you suck at something, at least you should tell people how long you're gonna suck for so that uh, they know exactly how long they have to have patience here. So, um, so just 20 minutes. I also want to say that it takes a village. Like, uh, don't believe that this is just something I thought of in my sleep without uh, any sort of input from, uh, from the community. Um, so the top row here is Tarek, Kyle, and Ashish. These are folks that I've chatted with. Um, Kyle's worked at Dogpatch Advisors, has done this type of thing for a long time. Ashish is building a company around this space. Uh, and Tarek has done this type of growth work for um, ClearBank and a bunch of other uh, folks. Uh, in the middle there is Main Street. So these are all my partners at Main Street, uh, specifically McKenzie on the far right middle there. Amazingly helpful, helped me implement a lot of this stuff inside of their HubSpot. Uh, and then on the bottom row, some of my data providers. So there's Keith in the bottom left, which we'll talk about in a minute. I did a growth experiment for them. Um, uh, and then we've got some folks from Signal Fire there in the bottom right hand corner, um, Tony and Olivia, that have just been amazing at helping me pull really, really, really clean data. So I don't want you to get the opinion that it's just the Jordan show here. Um, also, I have nothing to sell. Like there's nothing that I, I'm not trying to convince you of anything. I don't, I'm not, uh, there's no 499 thing after this talk that you can buy to, to do this here. I'm just gonna impart some knowledge that, um, that I have about some experiments that I have run in the hopes that this will be useful to you. Uh, this is also not just like a ramen experiment here for you to pour a bunch of hot water and uh, get a bunch of leads out. This is a really, really specific process about how you can target people by pain. So a lot of folks have used all these great tools like outreach and mix max to just send a bunch of emails to people uh, of a certain persona. So VPs of marketing at big companies and then puke to as many as possible. You get super low response rates. This is not that. Um, uh, and it's also not like this. So it's not a swarm approach, right? Which a lot of these folks will, will do. How do I add 100,000 people at the top of the funnel and just hope to get more out uh, by throwing more people in, uh, in the front? Um, it's very much a super hyper targeted way to find the people that are in pain now. And that's absolutely important. So you need to be able to identify who are the customers that have the problem that you're solving. And it's pretty specific too. So this is not VPs of marketing at uh, companies between 10 to 50. These are VPs of marketing at companies 10 to 50 that are missing their shoes right now and you're a shoe company, right? Like that's the kind of targeting that we're talking about. Um, and this targeting, I get 80 to 90% open rates here and 11 to 30% positive reply rates. Um, depends on the audience and the messaging, et cetera. And interestingly enough, this is not about the copy. Um, I will walk you through some copy today, but it's not about, oh, I said the right thing to trick you into replying. Like, no, it's that I found the right person and you could almost say anything to that person. Um, and this is a hard, especially pre-product uh, market fit. And the interesting thing about cold email is it's, it's very specific. You're talking to a person. A lot of people think about it like marketing. Cold email should not be marketing. If your goal isn't to get a reply to have a conversation with someone, you should not be sending cold email. It's not a good idea. Uh, and I see a lot of founders that will uh, try to boil the ocean. I can help anyone that's a doctor uh, in any country, right? This is not that. And that, that leads to failure, I think, as a, both as a company and certainly as a cold outbound strategy. So it may be that there are four different personas across six different industries that you can help. But this is not about boiling the ocean. This is about who can I deliver the most amount of value to and where is the signal that shows me who those people are. Um, and really, it's about having a minimum, mark markable, re minimum remarkable product first, and I really love this framework. And jobs to be done is a really good framework to evaluate your idea, 
or what you're building against this. So if you're in the pre-product market uh, fit stage, there are a couple of people that hire a milkshake, right? So there are the parents that hire a milkshake to keep their kids quiet. It's wonderful for that. It's like hard to drink, it takes forever, uh, it's delicious and sweet. Um, then there are other people that hire a milkshake to um, entertain them on their way to work, right? Because it's slow, it's not messy, I can uh, eat it in the car. And those are two different jobs to be done framework where you would do two different types of targeting. The messaging that you're gonna have to the parent that's trying to raise a child uh, that just needs five minutes alone is gonna be totally different different than the message that you're going to deliver to the commuter that's trying to get to work and just wants something to entertain them to not get the car uh, a mess. So this is kind of a good framework to use to evaluate what you're doing. Uh, and really, this is like a good graphic that I've seen that's about like, what's the skateboard? So again, if you're building, we're thinking about targeting at the skateboard level, not like uh, a, a car. So to give you some example, I'm building a tool called Blueprint. Um, and it's about combining data to target homeowners. So um, we are monitoring all the homes in the pg e service territory that have power outages. We're gonna pull permit data, and then we're gonna actually message contractors that have installed solar panels on those homes to say, hey, Larry, uh, did you know that your customer, Jordan Crawford, that you installed solar panels on 1019, just lost power for 13 hours and 42 minutes? Um, now might be a good time to reach out to him to install a backup battery. That's the type of targeting that we're talking about because I actually can now inform the customer about something that they didn't know before with someone they already have a relationship with. So I'm gonna kind of walk you through some, some examples of how you can do this in B2B. Um, so let's talk about Sid. Um, my, my friend Sid is running a company called Broca and they're uh, doing AI plus ads. So how might Sid think about targeting folks? Well, um, he needs to think about what, it, what is a case where the AI is gonna be able to generate better ads than uh, advertisers are currently running today? And this is easy to find, right? You can look at companies that are running Google Ads today just by running a you know, very basic search and then look at that copy and then run AI against that copy and say, okay, let's look at these two things. He's an expert marketer, so he can say, I know that this one's gonna convert better. So now he can talk about a specific ad that he's seen about a specific customer, and he can say, here's what the AI uh, has done to be able to improve this, um, you know, improve this conversion rate. Uh, my friend Will, my friend Will runs a company called Bouncer, um, and he's realized that there's, there's really growth inside of fraud. So he worked at uh, Lyft and did a bunch of their sort of fraud analysis and found that a lot of people were being uh, prevented from using Lyfts because they were using prepaid credit cards. And it turns out a lot of fraudsters use prepaid credit cards. But there's a lot of people in the country that are unbanked that can benefit from uh, using a prepaid cr uh, credit card. And so he built a, a technology to be able to scan a credit card in the system and enter that into an app and uh, basically evaluate fraud of that person real time, right? So what Will's gonna look for are, who are companies right now that have payment pages in their app that are losing conversion rate? Now, there's a bunch of data sources here, like App Annie, for example, to get traffic. So Will could actually calculate at the app level what are the apps that have a bunch of traffic that have payment in app, right? So they don't use Apple Pay or something like that. Um, and then you can have an outsourcer actually go in and say, who are people that are not using uh, efficient forms here? And then he knows what the additional conversion, uh, uh, you know, how that works with a, a scanning um, software. So he can say, I know exactly how much money that you can make if you implement my software. Uh, my friend Mac, he runs a company called Comstore, uh, really about uh, building communities and the right market beats all. So in some cases, you're going to find that there's a really heavy row to hoe, uh, road to hoe and um, you know, they're building software in, in community tech. And so uh, he's kind of in a fortunate market here where a lot of people are uh, clamoring to, uh, to have community tools because there's been nothing. And these are really the best types of markets to sell into. And you're gonna have a harder time doing what you're doing if the market isn't sort of um, uh, in a, a general state of pain. Um, and so that's just another lens to, to think about when you're pitching your product. Uh, and you really, you can use cold email to test. So cold email is a really great tool to be able to test, uh, uh, am I targeting the right people and what is the value that I'm providing?
So let me walk you through some bad email here. Um, this is, I get lots of bad email. I talk about it on LinkedIn all the time. This thing sucks. And let me walk you through why it sucks. Um, there's, it's like kind of obvious that it sucks, but let me talk about each piece that sucks. Um, so right, right away, Google's like, this is spam. You don't wanna, like, you don't wanna read this at all. So you need to avoid getting in this category. Um, Jordan's invite, this might seem good. It's like, oh, it uses my name, but it uses my name as a gimmick. It's not about me. It's not the fact that, I like boba tea or that I'm really, you know, I'm into cold email, right? That'd be a different thing. If he said, Jordan, I hear you're into cold email. That would be amazing. I'd open that cold email. Uh, and then like, congratulations, you've been selected. Why have I been selected? It's just like if you're coming up to someone at a party and, and you say, hey, how's it going? Uh, I saw you that, you know, that you enjoyed this or that my friend said that you're really big into pianos, right? Like you have to find a way to start the conversation and this feels so scammy. Uh, then the first thing they say is about them, right? This is the thing I see wrong all the time is that you don't get empathy right. You, you immediately launch into, here's all the things that I'm doing. No one cares about what you're doing. They care about themselves and the problems that they have. Uh, don't ask for two things. I see this all the time. If this is interesting to you and you like this and you want to be a customer, here's my scheduling. You'll never know. You want to make it as easy as possible to say yes. And if you can get a customer reply, that's what you're optimizing for. You're optimizing for reply, not a sale. I don't know why this like just clearly comes up as spam. I don't know. <laughs> dot, 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 that, you know, don't do that. And you'll notice that if you look at a lot of email pieces of software that they get this wrong all the time, right? That they're, they've got returns here. Um, and the thing I'll say is targeting is a thousand percent better than great copy. So if you find someone that's in pain that really needs help now, that's going to be your golden ticket every day. And I could say to this person, hey, it looks like you're sick. My name's Jordan. I'm from Robot Company. I sell Pepto-Bismol, right? He's going to respond no matter how bad of copy I write, as long as I've identified his pain. And this is really about understanding. So uh, this, you know, this blind gentleman, what, what are the problems that he may be suffering, right? And as a non-blind person, it's going to be really hard for me to be able to determine that. So it's like, this might be, um, oh, actually having a tennis ball on the end of his cane might be really helpful for uh, finding curves, right? Um, it might be that he needs like help with training his dog because the training service didn't do certain things, right? But you really have to understand your customers to do this right. And the very best way to do this is to talk to existing customers. Talk to your best customers, your customers that say, I can't live without you. And you're gonna find a spectrum. There are gonna be some customers that say, yeah, you know, you're nice, like I, I'm happy with you. But get those customers that you could say, if I charge double, would you still pay for this? They're like, absolutely. And then figure out what's the moment, what's the insight that you have that they're like, Yes, Jordan, I need this now. So I'm gonna talk about two case studies. The first is a manual case study I run for Primer, um, say primer.com, they do, um, so Keith uh, runs, uh, runs Primer, does a lot of this kind of uh, really great data for, uh, for sales. Um, and really one of their primary value pitches is they do ad targeting to specific people. So instead of, um, instead of sort of the masses here, like, hey, if you're in B2B, you're just like spending money on Facebook and it's like, give me generally people that are in San Francisco that are between these ages in the hopes that you're gonna target those folks that are actually decision makers at startups that are doing bad ad targeting. So <laughs> I, found, I, I Googled Keith and this is the photo I found of him on his phone with his, with his wife, like, what are you doing, Keith? But then I found the second one online, which is great. So Keith loves that I use this photo. Um, then you want to really quantify the pain. So uh, for example, we started in Keith's case of who are the people that are using demand-based and terminus, right? The account-based marketers. Uh, and then we said, who's running ads now? So we, start, we did this exercise, the start of the pandemic, and a lot of people turned off their ads, right? So I don't want to send a cold email to Peerspace who did space rentals and say, hey, Peerspace, like, it looks like you might be interested in running better targeted ads. Like, no, they're like, no, we shut down our whole business because of, of, of the pandemic. Like, why are you saying this to me? It just comes off as insensitive in this particular case. So what we did is we found companies that are uh, 
already running ads. Uh, and then we looked at the comments on their ads. So in this case, a lot of spam, right? I think this was Atlassian, right? Like Atlassian, they are a thief. Like um, uh, there's like links to some politician article, right? Like these are people that are spending money on paid ads that are clearly advertising to the wrong people. Uh, and then we like clicked in a little bit deeper and say, okay, this guy's in Nigeria. And so uh, does, is Atlassian actually serving this market? And is this someone that they wanted to advertise to? Uh, then what we did is we actually looked at each of these companies' uh, similar web data. And we found out, so Atlassian has at the time 17 million views. And we, uh, we actually looked at the, tar the source of their traffic. So we could actually calculate based on sort of an average uh, CPC with a monthly spend, how much money they were spending on ads, right? So now not only do I know people that are running ads poorly, but I also know how much money they're wasting on these poor ads. So now I found just the cream of the crop. So let's break down what this messaging looked like. Um, so is company open to experiments? So it's personalized. And also notice that in the first couple of lines, I've added another uh, piece of personalization so that they can see that I sent a message specifically to them. And you have to think about the preview. That will come through in the preview. Um, so this is crazy. This is like one of the best performing campaigns I've run here. Looking through company's LinkedIn presence, right? We just went through that. I noticed that some of your recent ads, so we linked to the ad that we found, aren't getting the right kind of engagement. Specifically, I saw, and we found the commenter name, um, and then their title in this country, uh, engage, and they didn't seem like a good lead for you. And based on some analysis from similar web, it looks like you're spending at least $178,000 a month. That's why I'm reaching out. This whole sentence is about them. It's not about me and what great things Primer does. It's about them and their pain and about how I found them. Uh, now we pulled in their reference customer, so a recognized customer. So now they see a customer that they already serve today, uh, who, who you are. Um, and then why act now? So in this case, it's like, okay, prices are down. It's like you get more for your bang. Uh, social proof, right? Now, ideally, you'd want this social proof to be really relevant to the reference customer. That's kind of a, a rat's nest, hard to, hard to do that right, especially at scale. Um, but these are like here are results that other similar companies have had. Uh, and then all you're doing is asking a yes or no question here. All, always, just try to ask a yes or no question. So if you know that your ads can only target people like this, would that be interesting to you? Uh, and, uh, and this is like a, solving an objection. I always like to throw in a PS. Um, so if their ad agency sucks, it's like, hey, by the way, if you need someone to actually help get you to that next level, we can also find a partner for you. So did it work? Yes, it worked. Like um, this is the first campaign that we sent. We had a 30% positive reply rate. Um, uh, a bunch of people were interested. Some people clicked, which is like, actually, I think it's generally a negative signal. I'll try never to put links out. I don't want you doing anything but replying to my email. So let's talk about it at scale. So I just ran this, um, basically the same approach scale for, uh, for mainstreet.com. We're getting like 11% uh, positive reply rates in our email. I'm not gonna share with you the copy. That's like secret sauce they paid me for. Um, but I'm gonna talk to you about all the thinking that went behind it and the process here. So it's, it's really a sad state of affairs that our best in class data is bad for sales. So we actually sent out an email um, that had the number of employees wrong. And for this particular customer, employees was a really big thing. Um, and so you can't actually use Zoom Info or Clearbit, the best in class data uh, for sales. Great for marketing, absolutely amazing for marketing. I love the team uh, uh, over at Clearbit, uh, but it's really bad for sales. And a person's name is like the sweetest sound in the world to them. And every one of these people that I'm showing you here uh, for a lot of these data platforms will get wrong. Like, so Kyle, sneaky SOB, he's like, I'm the chief Mario officer, right? So if you use his title in the per personalization, he's like trying to sniff you out, right? Um, Jose has a, a, a diacritical mark over his name, right? Like a lot of these, uh, you know, if you get unit, there's Unicode problems. So I'm going to spell his name wrong. Um, there are other people that if in their full name, if they have like some other titles in LinkedIn, 
that that's going to get wrong. Um, I put an emoji in my name because this is a bug I found in a system that it, the emoji will grab as the first thing. So I'm hoping to get some cold emails with me with a mustache uh, as an emoji. Um, also, people go by different names. That's important. Some people capitalize their name. So you have to like proper that. Um, so these are examples of at scale. If you're not doing like data cleaning here, you're going to get wrong. Uh, and generally, I like to think that this is like a great use of the SDR's time. If I can provide them really, really structured data to comb through, to validate that, um, that if I can build the process, they're not sending one-off emails. They're literally just validating the information. So uh, in Mainstream's case, we used uh, sort of some combination of pain versus trust signals. So for our first three playbooks, we looked at a shared investor of a current customer. So I was looking at all of their current customers, their investors, and any of their portfolio companies that fell into my qualifying criteria. So I could start a message with like, hey, Larry, I saw that um, blah, blah, blah invested in you. And did you know they also invested in this customer of ours, like small world? Um, and this is like not necessarily a pain signal. I'm filtering by the people that can benefit the most from Main Street's product, um, but this is kind of trust. Competitors of existing customers. So a lot of people have envy, right? They're like, oh boy, if only I could be like this other company, right? And so I can look at all of the competitors of current customers. Uh, I think like G2 Crowd has this data, Apollo, uh, and then say, okay, do you wanna be like this customer that's used us? They made this great decision, you should do it too. Um, VC portfolio company of existing customer. Um, so one and three are sort of different takes on the same thing. Sometimes it's like a portfolio of a main street company. So it's like, hey, they trusted us. Uh, you know, they trusted you, so you should use us. Really it's playbook four that is the best sort of pain here. These are people that have uh, uh, grown in certain areas that make them most likely to receive a tax credit. Main Street's a really, really great tool, by the way. They'll just connect into your QuickBooks. They'll give you a bunch of money um, uh, back from the government for R&D tax credit. So these are people that have grown quickly that their, their actual credit back they get from Main Street has, has grown dramatically in the last six months. So they're in, in, a, in pain. Um, so then we wanna filter down just a company. So these aren't the exact criteria for Main Street, but like founded after X date, there's some qualification criteria here. There's some qualification criteria of like company size. Um, uh, so you can get more of a credit, but it only works for certain sizes. Um, uh, have certain amount of people in product or engineering, because if you don't, then you're not doing a lot of R&D work and then only headquartered in the United States. And then of course there are person filters, right? Who are the people that you want to target? So non-technical co-founders, all the other co-founders, really those are the ones that are gonna be making the decision. Um, and then we did some auto enrichment. So once we got the data, um, and in this case, we were using Primer to, uh, to vet that data, uh, sort of a first level. So take the results from the clear bit from the Zoom info, uh, clean it, uh, and then add our own level of enrichment. So this, this is like the kind of personalization that we added here. So we would run calculation variables against their number of employees or the year founded, et cetera. So I could say something really specific. I'm even gonna talk about their open job. So it's like, I noticed that you had six open jobs. That means that you qualify for an existing blah, blah, blah. Um, we also, I also can magnify that pain. So I know how long they get that credit for. So I can say some gigantically huge number about why they should, uh, should respond. Uh, we also remove the people that are worth the most amount of money. So um, anyone that in this case actually could calculate the value of the customer. So we want to do something totally different to the people that are worth half a million dollars a year or whatever, right? Like you want to send them gifts. You want to, uh, I've even seen people send like cold tacos, like the tacos weren't cold, but it was like a, you know, an unsolicited tacos, if you will. Um, so this is kind of what that playbook looked like. Uh, we would look at, you know, these sort, sort of four signals. We'd remove any of the competitors. We'd only include certain companies, only certain people. So that would remove a bunch of people. We'd live query HubSpot to say like, has anyone, um, at, like, do you already have this company? So you don't look silly when you reach out to them and be like, hey, we're already a customer, what are you doing? Um, put them in the playbooks, uh, enrich with, uh, with customized variables. Uh, and then we had an SD check the data one more time to make sure that nothing was glaring. There are th things that people with context versus people without context can understand. So whether it's an outsourcer that is going through and actually, um, you know, kind of making one level of cleaning. Someone with like local context is gonna be able to say, well, 
yeah, they say their name is Larry, but really you could tell by looking at their LinkedIn that they go by Lair or whatever. Um, so um, so those are um, those are kind of the last uh, last check, and then we just pump more leads into this uh, every month. So um, so congratulations, you're an expert. You now know all that I know, um, and would love to open it up to any questions that you have here. And um, we're going to talk ideally about questions that you had about what you learned today, uh, and then we'll. Uh, after that, we'll actually take some uh, um, some like existing customers that uh, that you have. And Fodi, I'm going to make you the the host again. So if anyone wants to just like take take the mic here and ask questions about if you had any questions about what I presented or um, yeah. I don't know, Fodi, are, are people able any, to unmute? Any, any questions, guys? I mean, you can just click unmute. On the how much, I mean, the big thing that struck me in the process is how much time you invest versus the, the value of the lead. I mean, it, you, you're, you're doing major, very, uh, very high level analysis requires pretty, pretty big skill set for every one of those leads and emails. How do you uh, systematize it? or, or figure really, out how much time to invest? It's a really great question. And this is why this is for B2B. So like you can't do this if you're, if you're selling a, a 10 or a $20 product. Um, and the question that I always like to ask is like, um, what is a closed deal worth to you? And so it's like, okay, if every closed deal is worth $100,000 and let's say you spent $500 per lead, like just some insane amount of money, right? Like every day of the week, you should make that investment. And so I think that the, the, the sort of the, the question belies a different problem of thinking, which is like, but I can just load a bunch of people inside of outreach and reach all the people that I want anyways, right? Um, and so like, this is why I, I kind of talked about the scaled and non-scaled version. In the scaled version, um, right now, like we're using, say, Primer to do all of the manual enrichment for us. So like they're taking the clear bit data and making it cleaner. SignalFire, if, if you're ever looking for money and want to do this, SignalFire has like awesomely good data. Um, and so uh, I would definitely recommend them. And they can get you 90% of the way there. Um, uh, and you can see like what the thing I did for Main Street, like I'm not going to have to touch this again. Now you can also add more leads by adjusting company and person filters. The stuff that we uh, the stuff that I did for um, uh, for Keith, the primary example, uh, that's like all outsourcers, um, and you know, so so yeah, there, there's there's something. Your your question is a good one, um, but I think that I like to flip it around and say, what is a lead worth, and, and is it worth it? And then the question you have to ask yourself is like, what can I do in sort of an automated way, and then what can I do in a scaled way with outsourcers um, to to make this like a 10x better improvement. Um, and, and I think if you're, if you, if your dollar value is high enough, it's, it's, it's worth it. And do, so just to follow up, do you think you can, I mean, what you've shown is an expertise in pulling together all these sources and coming up with an interesting way to turn that into a compelling email. That's a, that's a pretty special skill set. Do you think you can teach that? Is that what you're doing here? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that's the goal, um, is that in this, uh, in this talk, I actually want to bring people up to the stage and like, so like, like, this is a good place to start. Like, who are you targeting? Uh, my current one, and I've talked to Keith about it, it's a very difficult one, is doctors to sell uh, medical remote patient monitoring, medical devices for, for, for doctor practices, um, getting them to, they, they can build through Medicare is the, is the long and the short of it. If you get a, a pul uh, weight or blood pressure, um, thing and they can make a lot more money than they're currently making by billing for these things through Medicare. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I think that, you know, in that case, like you're kind it's a little bit harder because you're looking for a consumer pain to sell to a business. Um, uh, it sounds like, um, uh, uh, well, no, no, the, 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 well, we, we don't want to go too detailed, but the, the doctor makes a ton of money by increasing the amount of billing that they do to Medicare. So it's, it's selling to the doctor. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I think that the the kind of questions in my head are like, okay, who are the, um, like, how do you know they're doing X now? How do you find that they're doing X? So like, that might be that you look about people that are talking about 
a higher billing, or it might be that you look at their website and you say, who are people doing this exact thing? And so that might be just like actually adding a layer of personalization to your outreach. So it's like, let's look at all the doctor websites and um, see if people talk about this particular device. And you could say something like, hey, Larry, came across your website and I noticed that you were selling um, these like, or like you provide blood pressure monitor services. Um, you know, did you know that you, you, there's another way that you could be charging for this? Um, and you also could think about prox like proximity here as like a trust signal instead of focusing by pain. Like, hey, um, hey, Bob, I see that you're rated number one on Yelp in Boston for this type of thing. Did you know that we work with this other uh, Boston provider and we get them 10x the value, right? So you can kind of play around with this notion of like who's in pain and, and who's, who's trust. I, I took the really simple route on that and I did Arkansas doctors, but I didn't go the two layers deep that you're talking about. Yeah, which. yeah, that's, um, that's important. Like, so for, um, for, for my business, what we're doing is we're helping uh, folks drive home leads. So we actually like uh, look at your entire CRM and find the nearest neighbor to the lead. So I can say, hey, Larry, like, uh, it looks like your home is really perfect for solar. We worked on Bob's house just three stores down at 128 Main Street. So I can tell that programmatically for every lead. So you have like a most relevant trust signal. Yeah, um, cool. And you can kind of think about this as stacking. So like you can sometimes stack pain and trust where, to get someone to reply where it's like enough. So the pain isn't as acute. It's not as like good as the type of things that we're doing for, for Keith, but the trust might be good enough that it's like, oh yeah, I know Frank. Like, yeah, sure. I'll talk with this guy. Cool. Thanks. Good ideas. Um, does anyone else want to like ask questions or like talk about their customer and uh, we can brainstorm a little bit. Um, and that's what, by the way, that's the next sort of 25 minutes of this talk here is we're going to be going over your customers and talk about how you might think about this. Yeah. Maybe I have a question. If you really want to, Go at scale, and if you have more of a product lab company and uh, more very low ACVs, so you need a lot of them, is there a way to wait, make it work for that as well? Because you mentioned in the beginning that it's really not for marketing, it's more yeah, for sales, for direct con conversation. So if you have a very low touch product, is there a way to make that work too? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I think so. Um, I just, I, I say this because I haven't explored this like fully automated, like no context. Um, way to do this. I think that the hard thing about this is when you're sending a cold email, it like to ask someone to do something in a cold email that's not reply um, feels like the wrong channel. So like, I, I think that like, this is actually a perfect use case for a primer. So like, you could say that, um, like if uh, Bob company was a client, you could look at all of Bob company's competitors and then run Facebook ads against those competitors, those specific competitors and be like, Hey, did you know Bob company uses our stuff? Like maybe it's time for you to use it too. So that's like specific messaging, but you're choosing a channel that's more appropriate to what you do. Um, the, the thing about cold email is like people expect to reply to email and talk to a person. And so like you could weaponize this um, for marketing purposes, but to do so would be just that. It would be weaponizing it. And I don't think that, um, I, I personally wouldn't do that. It doesn't seem wise to me, um, but you could do like a sign up email. So if someone signs up, you could say, hey, congratulations. Did you know competitor uses us? Here's how they use us and provide a relevant case study. But in that case, it wouldn't be for like cold prospecting. All right, thanks. Uh, Jordan, hi, this is great. Uh, I've got a question about uh, drip campaigns in general in your world. So to the extent that you're making the kind of investment that you're making up front with your targeting, does that imply that you're not really running traditional drip campaigns? Well, when you say drip campaign, what do you mean? Just like follow up on these cold emails? Yes. Oh, for sure, I follow up. Like, I'm not going to invest all this time and not like like send people more email. I will send them more email. I mean, it's not absurd, and I'm not doing things like, oh God, I saw, I saw this great. I shouldn't say this because it's recorded, but I the um this one very large marketing company sent a friend of mine that works on Porsches um a book about like a cold book about Porsches, and then sent him like I sent you this thing you owe me a meeting. <laughs> and, uh, and then like he got sent to ficus one time and this like sales rep was like, how's the ficus coming? Have you watered the ficus? Like, hey, aren't, is the ficus still alive? Um, and like, like those are examples of really bad follow-up. Um, 
I try to make my follow-up like useful to the person. And so um, like, so for example, in the Main Street case, like we looked at um, how much money you, you will lose over time, like pain magnification. So I can actually remove that from the first message and say, oh, like I forgot to mention, like I know I said $2 million in the last email, but it's really $12 million because I, I like found out that you have hired six people in the last two months, right? So I, I, I try to extend that. Um, uh, and then, you know, I, I like having breakup emails too. Like, hey, if this isn't right for you, like no problem. Uh, and I for sure will hit other people at the company too. So, um, so I'm not like gun shy about, about using this targeting to like find multiple, uh, m multiple folks in. And I'm also not gun shy about sending follow-ups, but like not seven. I do like four um, and, then, and then I break up. Gotcha, thanks. Sure. Um, I'll go. Uh, okay, Jordan, this is, uh, this is great, dude. Um, <clears throat> Thanks. so, uh, yeah, I guess I wanted to brainstorm about our customer profile. Um, so we're launching a, uh, an event platform that helps activists get in a room with their people through intimate music events in person. So we're, and we're, I guess we're kind of sort of creator economy focused. So we're looking for influencers who are activists, organizers, advocates, who may want to do events. Um, yeah. But they're like, they may not quite know that they want to do events. Like their pain is, yeah. well, they, they kind of have two distinct pains. Like one is they sort of reached a ceiling of engagement with their people. I want to like deepen that relationship unmediated by like, the social platforms that they've built that community up around. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then two, like the, the influencer activist community is super dispersed. Um, uh, and there's very little like community fabric that kind of binds them. Uh, and a lot of those people are looking for a stronger, stronger community ties to other people who are doing the similar kind of work to, to them. Yeah. So we're kind of we're trying to like solve both of those problems. Now our like solution starts with, hey, come run some events through our platform. Yeah, so the, uh, the way I think about this generally, especially in the types of things you're doing is that it's a, um, it's, it's work here, but it's, uh, but like I would score the market. So like, for example, I imagine like, uh, do you're act like, do they use Twitter a lot? I feel like Twitter is like the activist platform. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean like Twitter, Instagram uh, and then like with and we are kind of looking for people with a follow account past like a certain threshold yeah. for it to that's, make that's, sense you know that's the perfect place to start so I would like I would you, you, there's a tool called follower wonk where you actually can search for profiles so I would look at how can you like look at all of the profiles that include like certain hashtags or certain what are the a, sort of activist causes then I would mm -hmm. filter by follower count here uh, and then like you might actually look at where has their, like you can look at followers over time. So you could say, here's, here are the accounts that have plateaued. So I, I now know these are the accounts that like mm -hmm. have 20,000 followers that aren't getting more. Um, and then I also know all of the other activists in Boston. So I can send an email like, Hey Jordan, I see that you're, you know, you're pro tree frog. And, uh, and I noticed that um, there's like, 68 other people in Boston that are pro tree frog, like here's a couple of lists of them. Do you think having a, an event with these other activists as well as getting all your followers together might be useful to you, right? Mm. So the goal is that you can get them to, um, you can basically educate that activist of like, hey, I now know something about your follower account. Like, did you know that it's a problem? They're like, yeah, I can't break that. I wanna get access to more people. And then also, did you know that there are the, that these other people who are proximate to you you know, or, and maybe have more followers than you. So you're like, I know that you have 20,000 followers about tree frogs, but like Larry also in Boston has 200,000 followers and he talks about tree frogs too. Wouldn't it be great to get, so you can also like use, um, you know, you can use, if you have Larry, you can look at the people that follow and interact with Larry and then start spidering out that way. But I think if I were in your shoes, I might like score the market first and like say, okay, well, let's like just start with Twitter just start with Boston and then just start with tree frogs and then like know everything that we can about 
the tree frog activist in, in Boston. That's really interesting. It's like, because yeah, one of the things we've struggled to do is get that geodata on like where, actually like where is that person? Oh, oh this based, is like Twitter tags, know? Twitter tags tweets and Twitter um, also has like locations for, so it's like, look, you're going to like lose something in the, um, and actually like location data is often tagged inside of photos. So you can like mm. get data from photos. So like look at their media, like, uh, you know, a lot of platforms won't strip that out. If they're activists, they're probably much smarter than you and I about like keeping their location as anonymous as possible. But hmm. you might find that Instagram has better data here in, or Twitter. Mm. And so like, I would just follow your nose. Awesome. And I'm happy, by the way, awesome. I need to take this offline. Um, uh, I chat for free on Growth Mentor. So uh, if you sign up, you can, you know, book me for um, kind of unlimited amounts of time. Appreciate it. Sure. Um, so I think, so I want to quickly mention that I think Twitter also strips all of the location data from images, so you can't actually pull it from that directly. Yeah, I mean, you and you, you might just like, t like look at places here, like maybe put a, if people have Google Maps or like join me at this, like you'll find some, you'll find some concept of location. And you can also hack this too and message them and say, hey, I'm like organizing um, uh, people around this issue, like where do you live? So like, or like, what city are you in? And I'll go find, like, you can make a promise to a customer and say, hey, I see that you're really into tree frogs. Like, I can find all the other tree frog activators. Like, I want to start an event. Um, like, you know, which city are you in? So I'd actually like to ask a question. Yeah. So hi, Jordan. So I'd like to ask about what if you're really early stage in cold email and sales prospecting, uh, what's the most cost effective way to get started? Let's say you're like a small startup with not so much budget for solutions like Clearbit or Zoom Info or Primer. Yeah, um, you don't need any of that stuff. I mean, it's really about, and you should do this manually. Anytime that you do this process, like the thing I see time and time again is that people are really obsessed with scale. They're like so obsessed with scale. They're like, how can I do the wrong thing a hundred times over? It's like, no, think about do the right thing like for 10 customers manually yourself. So if that means like you have to go to Twitter to like find this activist and then like, like look through their tweets, things will emerge in that process. So, um, so like, especially if you're an early stage startup, like really the only thing that you need is like Google advanced search and, um, and like some platform to take a LinkedIn email. And so like AppSumo has like deals where you pay 50 bucks one time for an email. Like there's like free, um, uh, uh, Giles, Giles DC, I wrote a great post about how to find anyone's email for free um, from, and he was at sales flare or something. I don't recall, but, um, but you can find an email for free. I think that the more interesting question is like, where do my customers hang out? And like, who is, who is like talking about that pain? Um, and it, it could be anything from a company signal to a person signal, but that's the way I would think about this first is like, once you identify scaling, once you identify it, scaling it is a different thing. And to do that really right, what you need to do is remove the context out of your knowledge. And that's the hardest thing is like, you can, like, if you look at, if you like make do 10 rows yourself, you're like, oh, like find me anyone that has this problem. And as you do that, you're going to be like, oh gosh, I only know that because of this thing you want to create a rules-based approach to finding these people. And until you get there, you haven't done your homework. And once you can define the rule, anyone that posts about this hashtag, if they say this, then add this to this field, then that's, um, uh, then that's all you need. So like I'm doing this for uh, construction companies right now. And I'm like, tell me their, are, what do they work on? Do they work on bathrooms, kitchens, uh, roofing, and just like put check boxes so I can personalize that accordingly. Was that Thank helpful? Thank you so much. Was that helpful? Maybe that wasn't helpful. Hey, Jordan, we've got a good question from Fatima on the on the chat. Uh, she's asking whether um, it's suggestible to keep the same CTA across all of the follow up uh, trip se uh, sequence emails, or is it okay to kind of like mix it up? Yeah, you can mix it up. I just don't avoid double barrel questions. So, like, I hate when people drop their calendar link because it makes two assumptions. It makes an assumption they're interested. It also makes an assumption that they're going to schedule. You actually just want to flag for, is this something that's interesting to you? Do you, like, are, are you, like, do you face this pain? And you can ask that question in a thousand different ways. So, like, hey, Larry, um, like, are, 
like, do you, are you, do you currently, like, are you currently trying to like get together tree frog activists? Uh, and then you might ask another question like, hey, like Larry, did you know that there's this other person in Boston? Like, do you want to connect with them? So you're just trying to ask like yes or no questions as much as you can. That's actually super helpful for me too. Um, uh, my customer is founders, tech, tech startups. Um, and my product, well, I don't have a product. I'm part of a charitable foundation. So the way it works is startups pledge a percentage of their equity to charity that gets realized when they exit. So when we talk to founders, they're like, oh, this is a no brainer. It's super, it's free for me to do now, but I can boast about being socially responsible, even though I, I don't have any cash or time. But then it's at the bottom of the pile because obviously they're worried about like survival and hiring and, and fundraising and stuff. Um, so super interested in what kind of questions you think you would ask to get the yes or no kind of thing. I'm thinking something along the lines of, are you having conversations about your social responsibility or about your impact? Yeah, well, actually, I think this is the question that you're really asking isn't, I, I, don't, I don't think is a yes or no question. It's like, who should you target? And I think that mm. what I would do is I would look at the hiring pages of these companies because yeah. sometimes like we believe in this. And so the thing that people will get, they'll act every day on, of the week if, uh, if you're challenging their values, essentially. It's like, hey, Jordan, like, I see that you believe in improving diversity in technology. Do you feel that you're doing all you can to improve diversity in technology? It's like, no. The answer is always <laughs> no to that question. Like, and like, and do I like, oh, yeah. about it? like, yeah. So it's like, I like Atlassian, I think is a good example of this. Like they have on their values page, like, here's what we believe in. We give back. Like we, like, this is a benefit of joining us. So um, there's a company. Such called, a no brainer. Yeah. There's a company called Job Portraits, um, which is also building a, a thing called Before You Apply that um and then there's another oh, i forget the name of the follow up with me i'll, I'll remember it there's another like okay. licensed founder that has like a values board for engineering like so people yeah. hiring engineers it's like what does this company value and they do like cultural interviews so ideally what you want is you want to find as much signal as you can about the cultural values of the company and then you want to ask them if how they are living up to this cultural value and if they see any room for improvement and that's, you're asking a targeting question. Um, and yeah. so, so that's who I would go after, um, people that feel like a need to. And like, so for example, there are also like YC companies that are really about diversity in hiring that a lot of companies will like work with to be like, yes, I want to hire more diverse people. So you could find customers of theirs and partner with them and be like, hey, mm -hmm. this is another, I mean, th this is not exactly what you're doing, but um, but like you might think that there are other like pieces of software or things that people use to, to like signal that they care about giving back. Um, and yeah. that might even be the product itself. I mean, there's a lot of like, like conscious consumer companies. So it could be a product, it could be a hiring signal, but um, that's why I would. Yeah, I like that because then afterwards like the follow-up can be off, you know, we do the DEI programming for people who've already pledged. So then it's like a, a double piece of value. Yeah, that's and pretty like, helpful. You, Thank you. You know, like there's like there's like ways, sketchier ways to get at this too. Like like you could even use like machine learning on all the images their employees and be like, yo, I, I noticed that you're like pretty white. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> like that. So yeah. like I mean, I I would do that, but I'm just saying like there are other ways to get at this type of data to to like to inform the customer in a way that is going to be uh, useful to them. So if you can actually yes. do that to a point like. Like, hey, Jordan, like I've seen, and LinkedIn will, LinkedIn will tell you some of this, but like, hey, Jordan, I've seen that you, that you really believe in diversity and hiring, but I noticed that your last five hires, like, were not biopic or something. Like, like you could do things like that. You, you have to think very hard about the messaging here, but. Um, yeah, I have to be pretty sensitive. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you, you, have, you have to think hard about the messaging, but like, I think anytime that you can um, find a value here and then, and then like, ask people if they're doing all that they can to like live up to that value. That's like yeah. a pretty, that's like a pretty good motivation. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Hey Jordan. Uh, thanks. Thanks for doing this. I, uh, I joined because I actually really dislike um, cold outbound and as a recipient. So I wanted to kind of see how to, how to do it. I think one of the reasons that what, why I'm not a huge um, fan of it is because Obviously, it scales, and then it becomes 
you know, wrong and you get just garbage uh, and a lot of irrelevant things. And like, you know, it's a numbers game, I understand. And sometimes it works, but, but my question is about the cost of it not working, right? So if this is your first touch with one or several people in a, in a company, what is the cost of, of kind of deteriorating your, your kind of your brand really? And I guess then the, the following follow on to that is at what point would you consider actually manually reviewing all your outbounds in order to uh, minimize the cost uh, against your brand? Yeah, it is a good question. And I think that the cost to the brand is bad outbound. I think, um, I think really good outbound where people are not interested is a costless exercise. So, well, I should say it's not costless, but it's low cost and you're always going to make mistakes. Like, like I sent out some emails where I use clear bit data on the employee count. And I got, <laughs> I got that email like, you shouldn't send cold outbound to people without getting their employee count right. It's like, sorry. Like, so there's always like, you're, there's going to be like, cases of uh, uh, the margin it is a it, there is a volume component to this that you can't sort of get around and you have to be comfortable making like i guess like brand mistakes but i don't know of any company that's like mcdonald's shuts down after sending too many cold bad emails like i've never even heard of like it like it's always this thing that people are worried about but i've never like <laughs> you know, like juicero fails after sending bad bad cold email like so i i don't like i'm not as as concerned about sort of the brand impact um but Ideally, you're doing your targeting in such a way that you're informing the person about something that they didn't know in the first place, right? And that's like great. People love to buy, but they hate to be sold. And so if you can provide information to someone about something that's happening at their company that they may not know about, something their company has done that is like not aligned with their values, something that, um, you know, uh, some pain that you've identified publicly, um, I think that's why you get such, um, you know, such high reply rates. Um, and yeah, I, I don't, I don't. Yeah, do no, that. That, I think that's a, that's a good answer. I think really, I mean, the assumptions, wrong assumptions are always like a little bit jarring. Um, but I think to your point is that if there is something that kind of how sure you can be about the value offering and, and relevance to the pain, I think really scales up or yeah. like alleviates that well. Um, and I have, but yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah, just, just to be clear, sorry, like, no, there's like three levels of enrichment here. It's like enrichment with like the best in class sales data. So like the clear bits of the world, like, the, the, and, and then like another enrichment that's like manually check all these things because I know that that data is incomplete. And then finally have someone with context manually check these things. So I think that in many cases, like if I had a magic wand, I would like wave it and say, I want every SDR to only be working in a spreadsheet. And I want to create a system so that they can work in a spreadsheet and uh, uh, instead of having to like, you know, so like in my ideal world, they're like adding a sentence or two about like personalization about the person that doesn't scale well. Like, and it could even be in the PS. Like, like if I sent a cold email to my friend Art and said, oh, PS, I see you're into, um, I see you're into Porsches. Did you know about blah, 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 right? Like that's like something that makes the sales like really nice and personal that you can't really outsource well, um, that takes like local knowledge. And I think as long as it, like if the SDRs can be working in sort of a spreadsheet capacity, um, but add that personalization, that's another way to do this. And I don't let anything go out the door until like a real onshore human person has like checked each of those things. Cause this is complicated enough, especially if you're doing it scale that things can go wrong. Wait, so sorry, yeah. I promise last, last, last part is then, do you then validate like not, you are personally not validating every row in your spreadsheet then? Uh, or... I have three layers of enrichment. It's like Zoom Info, Clearbit, uh, uh, Primer actually will enrich, like like have manually check each thing with an outsourcer, right? Like look for this. They run some al also algorithms against those names, right? Like my friend Kyle at, Brick at Brickstack is like working on a company name like normalization. So this is a huge problem. It's like, hey, I see you work at Rocket Ship Labs LLC. It's like... <laughs> Like, I'm not going to like respond to that person because they clearly don't like, they haven't done their basic. It's like proof of work. It's like a little Bitcoin in that way. It's like proof of work that you know my company, that you understand the problems that I'm facing. Um, and so, so like once I've had uh, an outsourcer clean most of it, 
then I have a final SD, like verify that. And that's like where I catch things like, you know, like Jose's of, of the world, like don't get caught because there's like a, there's like a discrimination bias against people with like non uh, 26 letter characters. You know, if you've got a tilde or something, these like platforms always like export that wrong. So, so like, that's a case where you may have to have an SD be like, okay, like let's, let's get his name right the way that he wants to be called. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks, Jordan. This is great. Sure. I think we got time for one more. Jordan, I just have one quick question. And, you know, first and foremost, uh, done a lot of uh, outbounding of various levels of quality and uh, nothing is, has yet to come, I think, uh, even even within striking distance of the work that you're doing here. So good to see you on that Thanks. front. Um, one question that I had for you is, is pretty tactical. I'm just wondering if there's kind of like a rule of thumb um, let's call it like dollar cost per lead because, you know, there's a lot of data that you're aggregating, cleaning, facilitating. And so it's, it's certainly, uh, it's really more expensive than just going to a Zoom info or, you know, one of the many, many data providers out there and negotiating down a, a cost per lead. Um, so when you're thinking about like reply rates and, and sort of what the threshold, like lowest threshold for ACB is here that like, this would make sense for. Is there sort of like a you know ballpark cost per lead that we should be thinking of uh, in order to operationalize efforts uh, at, this, yeah. at this level? Well, I mean, I think that the best parallel here is like, what does an MQL cost the company? Like, what is yeah. a marketing qualified lead? And just like use that as a benchmark. But all the types of things that I'm talking about are like 50K plus ACV types of of deals, right? And then, and I think that the way to think about this is not like, again, th people think about this like very reductively, like, okay, so, so what, you can get an email for 30 cents, that tells you nothing. Um, so like, so what, you can get like a clean name for 50 cents, also nothing. Um, uh, and it's, I think that the way to think about this is like, you can reduce cost over time by automating these things or like finding better outsourcers, like, like I use Mechanical Turk, for example, to check homes for solar panels. And I had three different Mechanical Turks do the same thing over and it was like three pennies. So like there are ways that you can take a dollar thing and turn it into a 10 cent thing. But the thing is that people don't start there. They don't think like, what's the best thing I can do? And then how, I, how can I reduce my costs? They're thinking, how do I optimize for cost? And that's like not the right lens. Uh, the right lens is like, how can I say the right thing to the right people? And I don't mind spending 10, 20, $50,000 like building up this process because I know I can reduce it over time. And this is an asset that once I build it, it's like the incremental cost of cold email is going to be way cheaper than Facebook or whatever other marketing channel that you want. Um, the really question is like, do you have someone that has enough headspace to be able to build this um, and, to, and to think about it from a first principle standpoint? And the answer is unfortunately usually no at, at a lot of companies. And of course, we can always shout offline as, as we have in the past. Huh? And by the way, you're doing a good job advertising warmly there on your, on your background. <laughs> I, <laughs> I suggest everyone that. uses uh, their Zoom background. Plug. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Everyone should do that. Just like get a huge banner and like put it on your ceiling. All right. Well, that's, that's all I have. Um, if you would like to um, chat with me, I'm on Growth Mentor. Um, uh, Foti here. Thank you so much for hosting this and doing all the hard work so I could just stand and speak. Um, and uh, yeah, feel free to connect with me on, on LinkedIn. I'm happy to like answer your questions, happy to schedule calls um, via Growth Mentor and talk about um, this for your particular customer. And thank you so much for donating an hour of your time and, and learning about cold, cold app out. Yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks so much for your time, Jordan. This has been great. Thanks, everyone. All right, take care.